Amen. Good evening, church. Galatians chapter number one. Galatians chapter number one. We will begin our journey through Galatians. Galatians chapter number one. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. It's good to be singing. It's good to have young kids, babies, newborns, infants, teenagers, 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40-somethings, 50-somethings, 60-somethings. Bob, you're 70-something, right? 80-something now? 80? Going 90-somethings? No 90-somethings? Any 90-somethings? Uh, just last week, uh, we had a former church member. Uh, many of you remember uh, Robert Urich. Robert Urich was a... Uh, uh, an African gentleman who was uh, been in our church for 25 years, 20, 25 years, um, and he uh, didn't speak too much English, uh, but my pastor actually led him to the Lord uh, about 40 years ago uh, in a church that doesn't exist in uh, Wachusett anymore. Wachusett used to be Wachusett Valley Baptist Church. Um, and he led him to the Lord, and when I got here, I didn't, I didn't speak any of Robert's language, and he didn't speak much English, and so I just grabbed the Bible that he was holding on to, and I opened it up, and uh, I saw my pastor's name in there, and I was quite surprised to see that, uh, and I saw the day of his salvation. I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing, and he had the, the Bible the whole time, uh, but Robert uh, last Thursday went home to be with the Lord. Uh, if there's uh, two things that I remember trying to get Robert to do. I tried very hard to get Robert to have a pepperoni pizza, and he never, ever had a pizza, never, ever had a pizza. In fact, uh, when I say what he always said, it'll, it'll sound very familiar with you. Uh, Robert, would you like pizza? No, 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 no. That's what he would say all the time. No, 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 no. So obviously he understood a little bit of the English language because he said no, 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 no. Uh, but I'm thankful that uh, I got to be his pastor for seven years, and it's about six years maybe, uh, but he went home to be with the Lord. So he was 80-something years old. I don't know his exact birth date because I don't think he knows his exact birth date. Uh, he just said he was in his 80s, uh, and so that was, <laughs> that was good enough for me. Uh, I don't know how old that is, but that's what he said. I think he had like 15 kids, 20 kids, something like that. He had a lot of kids, um, and he... Uh, Went home to be the Lord. So praise the Lord for a good 40 years as a Christian. Um, Galatians chapter number 1, and we're going to go through the first uh, 24 verses to get us to chapter number 2. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not of men, uh, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And so let's go verse by verse and line by line, almost word by word, and see what this is talking about. Paul, an apostle, uh, not of men, which means what? That nobody ordained the apostle Paul to be an apostle except it was the Lord Jesus Christ, who we will learn later on in this, this chapter, who spent much time with the apostle Paul, uh, getting him to become what he uh, turned it to be. Now, if you remember, the apostle Paul, he did have another name, and his name was Saul. Uh, and then he had the conversion on the Damascus Road. Uh, and the interesting thing about Saul, uh, Saul the Apostle, uh, Paul the Apostle, uh, also King Saul, they both came from the same lineage. Uh, but what's fascinating by this is that if you study the Bible out, uh, King Saul started off good and ended up bad. The Apostle Saul, turned into Paul, started off really bad and turned into something good. And so that's, a, that's a, a compare and contrast for anybody who wants to read the lives of those two men and see what God can do if you would just yield your life to him. It doesn't matter how much you've sinned. It doesn't matter what kind of sin you have done. It doesn't matter if you think that you are no good and God can't ever redeem you. God can save you. Uh, and the Apostle Paul is... Uh, when he says, I think it's in the book of Hebrews, that he is the chief of sinners, what that simply means is that there was nobody else or hasn't been anybody else uh, in, the, in the New Testament first starting of the church that persecuted the church as much as the Apostle Paul did. Uh, and that just goes to show you what God can do if you would choose to live your life 
uh, giving God the honor, the praise, and the glory. Uh, verse number two, it says this, uh, in, the, in all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. And I want you to see that word, uh, the brethren that are with me. So when we, when we study the life of Paul, and I think maybe somewhere in the future we, we will study the life of Paul, uh, we've been studying the life of Samson, and prior to that we studied the life of... Uh, uh, Gideon, yes, Gideon, thank you. We studied the life of Gideon. Uh, and there's people like that throughout the Bible that you can do Bible characters and you can study attributes of what they've uh, come to know and who they are. Uh, but when you study the life of Paul, you see that uh, Paul was not a cotton candy preacher. Paul was not going to tell you what you wanted to hear. Paul was going to tell you what you needed to hear. Um, and I, I love that about Paul. In fact, Paul is kind of like my hero uh, because he would sit back and he would stir things up and he would walk away and go plant another church. Uh, and I kind of like that because uh, you get people all jacked up, they start fighting with each other, and then you go tell more people about Jesus, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, but that was his MO. That's what he loved to do. Uh, that was his personality. That's how God used him to be divisive, in a sense, dividing people from their foolishness, but interjecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that should be our main goal and our main focus, is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when he says this word right here, and all the brethren which are what? With me. Listen, there's coming, it's very easy to be popular. In fact, when somebody's popular, everybody wants to flock to that person who is popular. But what is not easy is to maintain an attitude of consecration, meaning this, that people who are consecrated, they're set apart, they're something on, they're on fire for Jesus Christ, uh, they are contagious, but they run with a very thin crowd, a very small crowd. Why? Because a lot of people don't know how to live a consecrated life. A lot of people don't know how to live a life where they are completely sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we live in a day and age where people would rather have popularity, they want the booming churches, they want the compromises, they want the fog lights, the laser shows, they want all the touchy-feely stuff that goes on in these big, huge churches, but they don't want the consecration. And so the consecration is literally, you're willing to preach exactly what the Bible says. You're not concerned about people's feelings. You're not concerned about is somebody going to come, is somebody going to go. You're not concerned about how big the church is going to be. Your main focus and your main concern is, is what I'm teaching and preaching glorifying Jesus Christ 100%. Listen, there should never be a time, a day and age where Pastor Casey or anybody else gets behind this pulpit and they get gun shy about what they're gonna preach. Meaning, oh, I know this is gonna step on somebody's toes. Listen, if, if I'm studying, I know it's gonna step on somebody's toes. In fact, if it's not stepping on somebody's toes, I better go back to studying and figure out what is wrong with me. Because the, the preaching of the gospel is convicting, it's offensive, it's, it's upsetting, but when you leave, you leave better. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like you, you, you get a, a really nasty burn and you go to a Shriners Hospital and you go to their burn unit. You know what they do? They begin to do skin grafts on you. And they take and they put skin on, but before they put the skin on, there's times that they have to take and use an abrasive and take off all the dead skin from your flesh. And it hurts. It hurts real bad. There's a lot of pain that goes into it. But when they put the new flesh on, it feels really soothing and really good. Okay? That's kind of like what it's like going to a, a church where you're going to get strong, tough preaching. But notice what he says. He says, look, he says, and all the brethren which are what? With me. Listen, it's, it's, it's not specifically just talking about the brethren in general, but it's the crowd that ran with Paul. And that crowd that ran with Paul wasn't a large crowd. It was a small crowd, a crowd of just a couple of people. And what were they doing? Unashamedly, unashamedly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly where we're going to go. That's exactly what he's going to talk about. Notice what he says in, in the beginning of a salutation. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the things that I see in all the times when Paul writes the uh, majority of the New Testament, uh, what I see is in his beginning, he always says grace and then peace. And there's a reason for that. And I think we can safely conclude that the reason for that is that you will never have any peace 
until you have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in his gracefulness, all right? You will never have any of that peace that you want in your life until you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we've got to understand grace is that saving knowledge. When you find grace, what does she do? She gives you that peace that passes all understanding. She gives you eternal security. And I'm thankful that he, he in a sense, starts the, the, whole, uh, the whole book off that way, saying, look, the, I'm, I'm about to tell you something. I love you. I care for you. Uh, I, 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 I am, am thankful that you're there. I'm thankful the church has started. But I'm about to tell you something that's going to upset you. It's going to bother you. It's going to frustrate you. But I love you, and I want you to have grace. And with that grace, I'm going to bring peace to your life. And that peace is the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Look what he says in verse number four. He says this, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God uh, and our Father. And I want you to turn with me real quick to 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3, uh, verse number 9. And I want you to see, you know, oftentimes people come to me and say, Pastor Casey, what is the will of God. What is the will of God? And the, and the will of God uh, is, is going to be specifically the same thing for every person on the face of the earth, but after they achieve the same thing, the will of God could be completely different for somebody else than it is for you. And so you can't hold somebody accountable for their will in, the, in God's life and their will, or you can't hold them accountable for your life and what the will of God is in, in your life. And so look what it says, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. It says this, the, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. What does that mean? That if God promises you something, he's going to deliver. He's going to do it, right? So understand this. If he promises you something, he's not going to let it go. He will fulfill it. He never lies. He never will lie. He never has lied. He's never going to lie. He will fulfill his promise. Now, look what he says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Have you ever met somebody who told you something and they lied? Well, how about this? Have you ever met somebody who told you something and they didn't fulfill their promise? It may not have been a lie, but they just didn't fulfill their promise. Right? That may not be a lie. It may be an accident. Maybe, maybe they said something was going to happen and it didn't happen. Right? Listen, that, that's not how God is. In fact, that's what the writer here says. Look, it's not as other men are. And God is always going to do what he wants you to do. But look what it says. He says, but his long-suffering, what is he? He's long-suffering. I'm thankful that he's long-suffering. Toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, what is the will of God? What is the will of God? that every single person would come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. He, being God, is not willing that any should perish. And so before we even get far in the whole book of Galatians, before we get on the first, what, five, five verses, we see that the Apostle Paul is trying to reach the church at Galatia. He's trying to teach them the love of Jesus Christ. He's trying to tell them, look, I love you. I care for you. I, I want to be uh, an encouragement to you. And the best way to do it is to show you the grace and love for Jesus. Now, if you don't know where Galatia is and you don't know uh, your, your Old Testament or your, your, your old map, uh, Galatian, uh, Galatia right now is made up of the uh, western half of Turkey. Uh, and you know right now the western half of Turkey is not a Christian country. Okay, But the Apostle Paul, and I want you to think about this now, because I'm going I'm to digress and go to the side for a second. I want you to think about this. The Apostle Paul, uh, saved the Lord Jesus Christ, was the greatest missionary that has ever existed on the face of the earth. He was the greatest missionary, the greatest church planner. Everywhere you go, he started churches and he reached people for the cause of Jesus Christ. It should be no surprise to you right now that the western half of Turkey, if not all of Turkey, has no desire to be a Christian nation. There may be little pockets and sects of people who are trying to have Christian in their life and, and are born again believers, but probably for the most part, they're not out there evangelizing. They're just trying to survive. They're not killed from the Muslim country in which they live in. Okay? Now, I want you to think about this. The devil knew what he was doing going after Turkey. Why? He goes after Turkey, he then can go after Iran. Uh, he can go after Iran, he can go after Iraq, goes after Iraq, he can go all around, what, Israel, and to diminish the Christian influence in the Middle East, okay? Now follow me. It should be no surprising that as the missionary journeys went west and they went into Europe, 
right? What happened when they went west and they went into Europe? Churches started everywhere, right? Uh, D.L. Moody, Charles Spurgeon, uh, uh, some of these great pastors and great evangelists uh, stood on two continents preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to America and to Europe. It should be no surprise that if you go to Europe right now, what do you see? You see beautiful skeletons of buildings that used to be that are now museums, that are now, you pay to go in to see how beautiful it is so they can upkeep the building. But there, there hasn't been a preacher preaching there in years. There's no Sunday sermon. There's no Sunday mass. There's no Sunday homily. There's no Sunday benediction. There's no Sunday service. There's nothing. There's just go. It's another day for tourism to see a beautiful building being restored. Okay? This should be frightening to you because this is what's on the forefront. It's on the, it's on the ocean line of America right now. Okay, America's only 400 years old. You look at Europe, you know, 2,000 years old. America's 400 years old. And you will see a strong, uh, a strong leaning towards America to have a great apostasy, a great falling away from the truth. And the scary thing about that is, is that if we as Christian, we as brethren, don't get consecrated like the people who are following the Apostle Paul, and we go after what's popular, we will lose America, and we're not going to lose it because of politics, we're going to lose it because pastors didn't stand up and preach the truth unashamedly. And so it's our job, it's my calling, it's my job to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation, the way the Apostle Paul did it, the way that Jesus Christ did it, with love, with compassion, with tenderness, but also with fire and fervency, so that people can come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That should be our goal. Our goal as a church is also to have missionaries. How do you have missionaries? Uh, people give money, and what do we do? We turn around and send the money out to a foreign field, and those missionaries preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and people get saved. Uh, our missionary friend, uh, Romel Reyes, he might be watching right now. Romel, how are you doing if you're watching? It's like uh, 7.20 in the morning in the Philippines right now. He, uh, what, 8, 7.20? I think it's like 7.20 in the morning. He, uh, he just baptized 28 people on Sunday. Uh, there, was a, there was a shutdown, uh, and he wasn't able to go to the uh, baptismal pool uh, where he normally baptized people because of COVID, so since April. Uh, and so he finally got all these people together, and on uh, this past Sunday, he baptized 28 people. And so uh, that's, that's the importance of giving to the local church. That's the importance of financial aspects of supporting your local church, is that some of the people you have never met, but when you give money into the offering plate, I, as the pastor, turn around and send it around the world and God blesses by seeing people get saved and baptized. That's the exciting thing, right? That's, that's pretty exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. 28 people on a Sunday, man. That's, that's incredible. Look what it says right here. Verse number five, it says, To whom uh, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then verse number six, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that uh, called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Uh, turn back with me, if you would, real quick, uh, to the book of Acts, chapter number 15. And we don't have to get too far into the book of Acts, chapter number 15, uh, but we will see a, a, a direct parallel uh, to exactly what was going on in Galatians and exactly what's going on to the book of Acts, chapter number 15. Uh, Acts, chapter number 15, uh, typically, as is, is we find in the book of Acts, is when the church really started. Uh, they were first called Christians, first in Antioch. Uh, that's when the New Testament church was a Establishes in the book of Acts. Uh, and we find ourselves in Acts chapter number 15, and verse number one, look what it says. And certain men which uh, came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay, now what's the problem with that? Okay, the problem with that is that they had a church at Galatia, the, the church at Galatia, uh, the Galatians church, uh, and what happened is that somebody came in uh, to the church in Acts and the church in Galatia, and they started to teach another doctrine. They started to teach something that was corrupt. Okay, Now we're going to spend a little bit of time here. We might not even get through the 24 verses, but we're going to spend a little bit of time here because there are churches uh, that are out there that teach that you have to be circumcised to be saved. The problem with that is that that's an Old Testament principle and it no longer applies in the New Testament. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, okay, when he died on the cross, the temple veil was rent in two, which signified there was a breaking up of the Old Testament and the New Testament law. In a sense, it wasn't broken. You no longer had to follow it because Jesus Christ fulfilled it. And when he fulfilled it, uh, the temple veil was rent in two. No longer did man have to go to a high priest to 
confess his sins, he could now go to the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So follow me now. Circumcision, uh, that doesn't matter if you are, if you're not, you still go to heaven. It has nothing to do with the body part of a male being circumcised. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do uh, with your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, there's other people who say, hey, you've got to be uh, baptized as an infant uh, to get to heaven. That's, that's, you can't find that in Scripture. Uh, or uh, you've got to be baptized to get to heaven. Uh, there are some people that link baptism to salvation. The problem with that uh, is that that's not what the Bible says. And so people have these traditions, they have these rituals, and say, you've got to do this. Uh, if you go to the, don't go to the church down the road, but if you go to the church down the road, uh, you know, make sure you don't chew gum because the, the, the pastor or priest will tell you not to chew gum in church. Uh, ask Sean. Um, but if you go to the church down the street, okay, uh, they will tell you uh, that you've got to confess your sins to the priest and then he will go confess it to God. Okay, what do they have? They have rituals, they have traditions. What's the problem with that? It's not biblical. Okay, now go back to, uh, first, uh, go back to Galatians chapter number six. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Okay, now follow me. Any gospel that is not this, that is not every word that proceeds out of this book is another gospel, okay? I had a great conversation with a couple on Sunday morning after church, about 20, 30 minute conversation, uh, and they talked to me about being uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit, being full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, I, and they said something along the lines that, that the church that we had gone to said, unless you were full of the Holy Ghost talking in tongues, then you weren't saved. Uh, and, and I said, well, I understand what they're saying. I, I get it, but that's another gospel. That's not true. There's, there's nowhere in Scripture where it tells you to conjure up the Holy Spirit, where it tells you to, 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 to say the same thing over and over and over again, to have the Holy Spirit come inside you and, and all of a sudden speak uh, this unknown tongue. Uh, God knows English, he knows French, he knows Spanish, he knows Arabic, he knows Hebrew, he knows Greek, he knows every language on the face of the earth. Why? Because at the Tower of Babel, he was the one who instituted the new languages, okay? So God knows every language. So there doesn't have to be a mystery language that you talk to the Lord about, okay? But there are people that say, well, you're, you're not full of the Holy Spirit. The problem with that is that that's another gospel. That's a false gospel. Uh, there's some people that say, unless you're dressed in a suit and tie as a man, or you're wearing a skirt as a lady, uh, you're a heathen and you're never gonna serve in church. Uh, and what do they do? They hold these high standards and say, this is how it has to be, and if it's not like this, then you're not the good Christian God wants you to be. See, the problem with that is that that's another gospel. That turns into a preference, okay? And when someone starts taking a preference and making it biblical and saying, this is what you have to do, then there's an outside gospel trying to creep in. And then you're not making a change for the Lord, you're making a change for the pastor or the deacon or the Sunday school committee or this group or that group. You're not making the right change. Now, what we can understand is that the Bible says you should give your best to the Lord, right? You should give your first fruits. You should give the best of your time. You should give the best of your talent. You should give the best of your finances. You should give the best to the Lord. I had a couple that came to church about eight years ago uh, and, and they didn't make a lot of money. The guy was a janitor, uh, and I think the woman just was a, a homemaker, uh, and he, he, he didn't have a lot of money working for the public school, uh, but they had a garden, and every time they got a crop from their garden, they would always bring the church the first fruits of their garden, and they said, Pastor, we don't make much. We do tithe, uh, but we want to bring our first fruits to you in your home uh, because we want you to get the glory. Uh, we want God to get the glory, and we know that this is what we should do. And I thought, what an amazing thing that, you know, they, they were giving their very best. If your very best is, uh, no joke, a pair of holy shoes, I don't mean holy like H-O-L-Y, I mean H-O-L-E, right? Uh, and they've got a lot of holes in it. Uh, or you've got some ripped jeans, or you've got a torn blouse, if that's your very best, then that's what you should bring to God, right? You should say, hey, I'm gonna do this. Now, most of you have seen me not in a suit and tie. Most of you have seen me, and most of the year, I'm in shorts, a polo shirt, and flip-flops, sandals, right? Year-round, 
that, that's how I dress. But when I come into the office of the pastor, of, the, of a leader of the church, my goal is to be the very best of what I can be. And so as a believer, that's what we should try to do, give God the very best. Now, when someone tries to bring something in from the outside and say, this is how it has to be, they might try to take something from the Bible and say, I can see how we could twist it and turn it, and that's how it should be, and I get where they're coming from. It's just another gospel. And so we've got to understand that there are, as in Acts 15, people who are gonna to try to creep in and teach something that's contrary to scripture, okay? If somebody ever gets up here and, I'm pre or, and, and they're preaching, they're my guest preacher, and they open up a different Bible, I'm gonna walk up behind them and say, thank you very much for coming today, I do appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna take over from here, right? I'm not gonna let them creep in with another Bible. All right? If I'm not here, Sean knows to do that, Tyron knows to do that. People know to step up and say, hey, we don't do that here. Somebody starts preaching a false doctrine behind the pulpit. If I'm here, I get up, thank you, brother, I appreciate that. I'll take it from here. The live stream gets cut, and we automatically delete that video, and we don't use it. Why? There's a problem, right? We don't let it, we don't let it grow, okay? Now, we don't let a false gospel come in. And why is this important? Follow me. If you allow one thing that's false, to creep into your life, to creep into your ministry, to creep into your home, to creep into your marriage, to creep into your childbearing, to creep into what's going on, then pretty soon that one false thing is gonna create another false thing, create another false thing, create another false thing, and pretty soon you look back after a certain amount of time and you say, look at all the things that are corrupt in my life, in my marriage, in my church, in my home, in my walk. And so you've got to understand, what does the Bible say? And that's what I should do. See, there's all kinds of health, wealth, and prosperity books that you can read. There's all kinds of authors out there who are making millions of dollars writing books so that you can figure out 72 steps to be a better Christian or 101 ways to be a better wife, okay? If you want to figure out the better way to be a Christian, throw that book in the fireplace. You wanna figure out a better way to be a, a better wife? Throw that other book in the fireplace. Pick up the Bible and say, what does the Bible say? That's what I'm going to do, okay? It has all the answers. Don't let other things creep in and distort your perspective on who God is and what God is all about. Look what it says, verse number seven, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trouble, to disturb with emotions, to disturb in a sense with emotions. So I want you to think about this, and, I, and again, I wanna go back to the conversation I have at the church of the Sunday with this nice couple. Uh, emotions, oftentimes churches who are uh, driven or led by pastors who don't have the right motives are driven with fear. Can I get an amen? Yeah, they're driven with fear. Uh, they're driven with anxiety, right? Listen, we, we have an offering box in the back, okay? We haven't taken up an offering, I think, maybe two times since April, all right? We have an offering box in the back. People put money in it. They put, don't put money in it. I haven't even talked about it, okay? Uh, I'm not getting up here and saying, hey, you gotta give, you gotta give, you gotta give. We gotta do this, we gotta do that. that that's not who I am. Who I am is preaching the gospel, I just want to preach the gospel. If God puts it on your heart to give, then give. If you know that you should be giving, then you should be giving, right? But I'm not up here, eh, God's going to get you. You know, God's going to rain down fire from heaven. You know, I need a new Cadillac, so you make sure you give extra this week, okay? Uh, that's, you're, it's, it's, that's, not, that's, not the, that's not the gospel, okay? But there are churches out there who are driven by fear. There's churches that are driven uh, by the pastor who's like, I don't, I don't want to lose people. I don't, I, don't want, I don't know what people are going to think about me. Uh, you know, and there's all kinds of emotions that, that pastors will go through leading a church, and unless they're pure, they're not right. Pure. Pure. Pure motives. And the pure motives happen when the man of God studies the word of God and he gets up unashamedly and preaches the gospel. It's not about how many people fill the pews. It's about what the man of God preaches, the purity of what he preaches, God will bring the population to hear it, right? Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, okay? It's God's job to build his church. 
And if God wants to bless one man with a church that goes from one to a hundred in a year, and then the next year 200, next year 500, then so be it. But there's others that they toil and labor for 20 and 30 years, and they never had more than 30 people in a church at one time, right? That's just their ministry. Does that mean that one's a success and the other's not? No, no. the way that you measure success is the amount of control that God has in your life. You want to know if you're a real success? How much control does God have in your life? Again, look what it says. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. I've used this illustration many times throughout uh, my, my pastoring tenure that you would call. Uh, and, and I've said this. When you look at that word pervert, we, you got to look at, at, a, at what we call perverted. And I've said this before. I said, uh, I'm going to take everybody. I, I remember Miss Angie was there, I think, when I said this uh, eight years ago. I said, I'm going to tell the whole church. I said, I'm going to take you all out for a nice steak dinner. All right, I'm going to take you out for a steak dinner. We're all going off steak dinner. You don't like steak. You can have chicken. You don't like chicken. You can have tuna. You don't like tuna. You can have tofu. I don't care what you want, but I'm taking everybody out for dinner. The only thing I want you to do, the only thing I want you to let me do is let me pick the babysitter. How's that sound? And everybody raised their hand. Yes, Pastor, we want you to take us out. I can't wait to take you out. Uh, and, I, and I get excited about it. I say, this is what I'm going to do. You can pick any place you want to go, and I'm going to take you, but the only thing you got to let me do is you got to let me pick the babysitter. How's that sound? Sounds good, Pastor. Okay, where are we going for dinner? I said, okay, before we go to dinner, let me tell you who the babysitter is going to be. I'm going to go to the Worcester House of Correction, and I'm going to find the worst people who abuse children, and I'm going to let them babysit our kids. How's that sound? And everybody looked at me like, no, 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 I would never let those kids watch, never let them watch our kids. Why? Because I wouldn't want them to corrupt our kids. Amen? Amen? Amen. Ah, then why would we want to listen to a corrupt, perverted gospel? And it was just as silent eight years ago as it is right now. But how often do we let things that are perverted into our life? Perverted, corrupt, defiled, gross. They shouldn't be there. And we let it in. He says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. Tr trouble. Some that will, that, will, uh, that will try to disturb you with emotions. That they will try to, to bother you intentionally. You've got to be alert to that. You've got to be aware for that. Look at it says in verse number 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, that which we have preached unto you, let that man be accursed. Whoa! Whoa, we got, we got to understand what this means. Don't, don't, just, don't just gloss over this, okay? Don't just look past this. But what this is, what Paul is saying here is this, that if anybody comes to you and says, this is how you got to be full of the Holy Spirit, you got to conjure it up. You got to be baptized to get to heaven. You got to be circumcised to get to heaven. You got to do this to get to heaven. You got to dress this way to get to heaven. You got to look like this or give this much to get to heaven. If anybody brings anything that's outside of what the Bible says and they add to Scripture or they take away from Scripture, as it says in the book of Revelation, if there's anybody that does that, look what it says. It says that they let him be accursed. Okay, now when you look at that word accursed, we, let's, let's back it up and, and look at it from a, a, a bigger perspective. It's a divine condemnation, a divine condemnation, meaning that God is going to judge them very severely and very harshly because of what they're trying to institute inside the church. Wow. Now I want you to pause for a second. And if you've had a church, if you've had a chance to go to other churches, and you've had a chance to experience of the churches. Doesn't matter if you were a child, doesn't matter if you were lost or saved, as you're going back and looking in your mind at all the churches that you've been to, if there's any one of those churches where they try to bring in something that's not in the Bible and bring in a homosexual relationship, a gay man or gay woman can be a pastor or a priest, if they try to bring something like that in, perverting the gospel. If they bring in any one of the topics I talked about, perverting the gospel. And when you step back and you look at it and say, wow, no wonder why I didn't sense 
the presence of the Holy Spirit there because they were doing something or they are doing something that is accursed, that is a divine condemnation from God. This is earth shattering. Because what it does is it causes you and I to look at all the circumstances and look at all the situations and say, hmm, if I can't sense the Holy Spirit is there, as a believer in Jesus Christ, if I can't sense the Holy Spirit is there, then there's a problem there, right? Now listen, we don't have the best singers in the world. We don't have the most beautiful building in the world. You don't have the best preacher in the world. You, there's a lot of things that this church doesn't have. But you know what this church does have? The, you know what this church is, I've been told from many people who've come through, but I've been told by many pastors who've come through, and they say this to my wife and I all the time, there's something different about your church. Your church is on fire for Jesus and God is doing something in your church. And you know what I simply say? It's we just read the Bible, we talk about it, we preach it, and that's how we govern our church. That's not what other people do. You go to some other churches and they get 57 weeks of sermons already prepared. You know why? Because they bought them off sermon.com. Okay? Okay, they got all of these things figured out. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. Well, this church did this, our mother church did this, our sister church did this, but that's not the church. What church does across the street is not what this church needs to do. This church needs to do what God tells the pastor needs to do. Why? Because God is the one who speaks to the pastor, and the pastor is the one who speaks to the people. That's how it works. And as we said before, So say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than you have received, let him be accursed. There's three things you see in verse, um, verse 8 and verse number 9. You see the word we, but though we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel, we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel. And then in verse number nine, as we said before, if any man, verse number, any, verse number nine, if any man preach any other gospel. So we, an angel from heaven, or any man, preach anything that's not in this book, divine condemnation coming. Wow. That, that should bother you. Because there's a lot of churches who are playing church, but they're not really a church. You know, it's like the little boy and the girl, little girl. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage, right? And, and, they, and they, they, they sing that little nursery rhyme, right? They're, they're, not, they're not really married at five years old, four year old, three year olds. They're pushing around a little, little Barbie doll, a little, little plastic shopping cart, a little stroll, a little carriage. You know what I'm talking about. Right? Some of you do. Some of you look at me like I'm pastor. What do you do in your spare time? Uh, some of you are like crazy, right? They're not really a church. They're just playing church. They're going through the motions. They're, they're, they're just doing things. But the problem with that, the problem is that when they're adding things to the gospel, it's a divine condemnation that they will be cursed, cursed for doing the wrong thing. Wow. Look, he says, verse number 10. For do I now persuade men of God? Or do I, speak to, or do I seek to please men? For if I have yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Do I do it, number one, for Jesus? Or do I do it so I can get praise? If you're doing the service of the Lord to get praised, you've already got your reward. And when you get to heaven, what you did here on earth burnt up like wood, hay, and stubble. You already got it because you want to be praised. Or are you doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ? 
You say, well, I love the Lord. I'm just, I'm just doing it for the Lord. But it would be nice to get a thank you every now and then. Sure, it would be. Absolutely. It, it, it would be great to get a thank you every now and then. But you know, we shouldn't serve for a thank you. My wife and I and our family has been here eight years. The first Sunday of this month was our eight-year anniversary. Nobody said thank you. Nobody said I'm glad you're here for eight years. And I walked home with my wife and I said, I'm so glad we're here. I love serving God. It's not about the thank you. It's about the service. It's about doing it because you love the Lord. God sees what you do. And if you need a thank you, then you need to look in the mirror of the word of God and see why you're doing what you're doing. God said to Jesus, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. But you know what? When was that? The very end. 30 years he lived for his heavenly father. Every move that he made was for the glory of his heavenly father. And it wasn't until the very end that God said, this is my son whom I am well pleased. You see, if we serve for man, we've already got a reward. But we need to serve, as Paul said, for do I now persuade men of, or God, or do I seek to please men? No, I don't seek to please men. In fact, it would really bother me if everybody came on Sunday morning and they left smiling. I, I, I'm not here to tickle your feet and make you laugh. The job and the calling of a pastor is to preach the gospel without error, without sin, without hesitation, to see people do what? Look what it says. That I should be a servant of what? Christ. That my goal should be how much can I serve God today? Look what it says right here in verse number 11. But I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. W what do you mean? For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, of, of, uh, taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now listen, if you know the life of the Apostle Paul, he left his hometown and he went to study at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the smartest Jewish scholars of the day. He left his homeland to, to understand the, the Roman law, the Jewish law. He, that's what his, his goal and his job was, uh, to understand these things. And yet he says, look, I didn't learn the gospel from my friends. I didn't have anybody teach me what I'm teaching you. He says, look, look, where did I get it? I got it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now he's going to go on a little bit further in the next couple of verses. But what he's simply saying is, look, I went to the Lord Jesus himself, and he is the one who taught me. Now look, follow me now, okay? Uh, he says this, verse number 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church and profited in the Jews' religion above many of equals of my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers." But when it pleased God, who separated me from the, my mother's womb and called me by his grace. What is, what is the Apostle Paul saying? Saying, look, you have heard about my past. You've heard about my testimony. How there was nobody above me who persecuted the church. Paul was a murderer of Christians. Paul is the one who uh, told people to go kill Christians a persecutor of the church. And what he's saying is, look, you have heard of my conversation and time past, how I used to trouble the church, how I used to be very forceful in the church and do these things that, that caused great affliction on the church. But now I'm changed. Look what he says. Jeremiah chapter number one. Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah chapter number one, verse number eight. Jeremiah chapter one, verse number five. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Wow. So before your mom and dad even knew that they were expected child, God knew you. Wow. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I, I set thee apart. Wow. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. This is Jeremiah the prophet. This is the apostle Paul. Can I tell you what? This is you, Christian. Yeah, you done messed up. Most of you live pretty wicked lives up until you got saved. Most of you didn't have the, the fortunate blessing to get being, be getting saved at a young age. I've led some of you to the Lord. My wife's led some of you to the Lord. Most of you, if you had to talk about the things that you used to be and the things you used to do, you'd be embarrassed, you'd weep, you'd cry. You'd get angry, you'd get sad, you'd go through a roller coaster full of emotions. Me too. But God knew thee. And God knew one day you would receive him as your Lord and Savior. And so all that is all washed away, it's all under the blood. And what does God want? God wants you to be sanctified. What do you mean sanctified? Set apart. That there's something different from you than the rest of the world. That when someone looks at you, when someone hears you, when someone thinks about you, when someone talks about you, you know what they should think? Wow, that person is a strong Christian. I should get to know them better. Why did God separate Saul and make him Paul? Obviously for the furtherance of Jesus Christ. Why did God save you? Because that was his will, that you shouldn't perish, but you should come to repentance. But now that you're saved, what does God want you to do? Check it out. To reveal his son in me. Ready? God wants Jesus to be in you more than the world is in you. To reveal. What do you mean to reveal something? You know? What's behind door number one? A new car! What's behind door number three? A new toaster! Right? You're, you're revealing something behind those doors. Right? You know, a woman wears a veil on that wedding day and the man takes the veil and pulls it over her head and he reveals her beautiful, shining face. It's ugly, and he puts it back down, right? No, but he, he, reveals, he, reveals, he reveals the beauty of that wedding day. Christ is revealing the beauty of himself inside of you when you choose to let more of him be in you and less of the world, the flesh, and the devil be in you. Why? The Apostle Paul says that I might preach among the heathen, that I might preach amongst the Gentiles, that I might preach against the lost world, that I might give the gospel of Jesus Christ out. Notice, the Apostle Paul can be the same thing as you today, that you are saved because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Lord willing, you're here tonight, you're saved. If that's the case, can people see Christ in you? If not, there needs to be more of the word of God in you and less of the world, less of Netflix, less of the computer, less of the internet, less of the TV, less of the, all this garbage, more of Christ in you. Why? Immediately, 
I conferred not with flesh and blood. What do you mean? I didn't go to other people and say, is this true, is this right? What did I do? Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that which were the apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. What did the apostle Paul do when he got saved? What did he do? He began to get alone with God and study the word. Now, he didn't have the New Testament, okay? Now, we, we, got, we got to put things in context. He didn't have the completed New Testament. How do we know? Because he wrote most of the New Testament. <laughs> so he didn't have the completed word of God. But what he did have is an understanding that I know the Old Testament law, and that's dead because Christ fulfilled it. Now I need to get closer to Christ so he can teach me. What a luxury the Apostle Paul actually had. Now, we don't know if Jesus Christ was hiding in a, in a, in a cleft of a rock. We don't know if he came down to earth and he just he didn't touch earth, but he was right there. We don't know that. But what we do know is that the Lord Jesus taught him. And the Lord Jesus can implore any way, any mean, any method he wants. Listen, the Lord Jesus could have had a rock talk to the Apostle Paul. Okay? Can you imagine a talking rock? I don't know what a rock would say. But the Lord Jesus can implore any opportunity, anything, any the, the, does not the scripture say that I can make the rocks talk to me, right? I mean, the rocks would praise my name if nobody else did, yes. And so he could use anything. But we do know this. Look what he says. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now these things which I have written unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the region of Syria and, and, and uh, what does that say? Sicilica, and it was unknown by the face of the church of Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the gospel, uh, preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And notice what they did. We're going to wrap up the whole chapter with this. And they glorified God in me. You know what this is, folks? This is a testimony. That was Paul's opening testimony to the church at Galatia, but it's also to us that he went through everything that he went through. All the ugliness he did as Saul, he no longer did as Paul. He went through all of that. And in fact, uh, we could go to Acts, we could go to, uh, I think, Philippians, we could go to like several other verses in the Bible where Paul talks about what he did to the church, where he talks about what he did to Christians. He testifies of it. He doesn't boast and brag about, look how bad I was. He testifies about how much of a heathen he was. But then he testifies about God's grace. In verse 24, verse 23, verse 24, we hear his friends and believers in Jesus Christ, hearing about what he was doing. And what did they do? They glorified God in him. Let's wrap this up with a pretty bow. If you're saved, are you saved? Are you saved? If you're saved, be like the Apostle Paul Teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person you come in contact with that they may glorify God in you. People are watching. People are watching. How do you know people are watching? I've been working out of the same gym for a little over a year and a half. I said, Pastor, you haven't lost much weight. You still got a big belly. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm getting on. My wife's a good cook. Uh, I've, lost, I've lost fat. I've gained muscle mass. Praise God. But here's what, I, here's what I gained this morning, working out there for a year and a half. A lady finally walked up to me and said, Pastor Chris, can I talk to you for a minute after class? Yes, well, of course. And then she began to talk to me about her testimony. She began to talk to me about her family and some circumstances that were going on in her life. And she said, I was just waiting for the right time to talk to a pastor who could tell me what I need to do. She was watching a while. But yesterday or this morning was the day. People are watching you. 
People are watching you have good days. People are watching you have bad days. People are watching you have days that you'd like to jump off a cliff. People are watching you have good days where you'd like to jump out of an airplane with a parachute. People are watching you. Let them see Christ in you that they may glorify God because of you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you so much for all that you're doing in our lives. God, thank you for the provision and the protection that you've uh, put around this church and around our home and around our community. God, I pray you continue to bless us as we serve you. Lord, let there never be a day where an accursed gospel is preached and taught in this church. Lord, let everything that be said here and done for as long as I'm the pastor be for your honor, your praise, and your glory. We love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.